he's had some pretty critical comments about Netanyahu, and Netanyahu has, has hit back. I wonder if he is slightly recalibrating the way that he handles Netanyahu. He is very pro-Israel, he's been very, very supportive in so many levels, but I wonder if the patience is getting a little bit thin. Rejoin the Customs Union. Dear Keir Starmer, if you're listening, rejoin the Customs Union. Number one most obvious way of restoring confidence and getting our economy off the ground. Welcome to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And today, a lot to get through here in Methodist Central Hall, about which a bit more later, but we are going to be doing Joe Biden's State of the Union Address, Gaza. We're going to be doing the UK budget. We're going to be doing the Portuguese elections, and we're going to be doing Steak Knife, about which you've been WhatsApping us. Tell us about Steak Knife. Steak Knife, double agent, IRA, hitman, uh, IRA interrogator of possible touts, uh, informants, but there's a pretty remarkable report into, into his activities. So, yeah, just to say to listeners that if you hear the occasional background noise, it's rather an old and creaking building, this, but Rory and I have just been talking to 1,200 politics A-level students. Uh, unlike Richard Tice and Jacob Rees-Mogg, we didn't get booed. In fact, they were rather warm and friendly, and they asked some absolutely brilliant questions. Yeah. Well, actually, I'd, do, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, but let, let's loop back to that at the end. But let's start with Joe Biden, yeah. State of the Union Address. Yeah. So those of you like us that are uber geeks in politics can see the full thing on C-SPAN. He comes in, he spends probably about 20 minutes pumping hands, saying hello to people in the Congress. So just to remind people, this is the President of the United States speaking to assembled senators, a member of the House of Representatives. He then gives a speech, which is almost an hour long, mm -hmm. and then he spends another half hour working his way around the floor. So the first thing, I mean, I'll give it's a pretty low bar, but it's an important thing to establish for people who think he's actually totally medically incapacitated or senile, is that he's able to push on through two hours of pretty serious handshaking and speaking. He delivered the speech fine. I mean, he, uh, he didn't deviate off the script. There were no great uh, errors, despite the delight of Trump and the Republicans to try to find any elements of his age. It was a fine, patriotic American speech. And there were bits of it that could only be in America. So one of the things he announced in it, which we'll come back to, is the announcement that the US is going to create essentially a temporary port mm. in Gaza. Mm. You can't really imagine the British Prime Minister just standing up and saying, we're going to create a temporary port in Gaza. You can't imagine the British Prime Minister saying he would uh, create a port in Gaza. But he also touched on domestic issues. He dealt with immigration. He dealt with his investment in the IRA, uh, which is their Reconstruction Act, not the IRA we're going to talk about later in the show. But I wanted to come to you first because you've actually been in the heart of this because George W. Bush invited Tony Blair to travel with him in the car, sit next to him in the State of the Union. And Tony Blair was in the position that I think I saw the Swedish Prime Minister in when I watched the State of the Union, which yeah. is sitting right next to the President's wife. So yeah. tell us what that's like. Um, well, it's a big, big, big deal, uh, the State of the Union. I mean, it, it does get, for a political event, you know, very, very big viewing figures. People sort of know it's happening. It's one of those rare events in the, in the political calendar that does give you the opportunity to cut through. And I think that's why it mattered so much to to Joe Biden. And I agree. With, I thought I thought actually it was a good speech, and I thought he delivered it very very well. And I think he will have certainly for the short term, medium term, put to bed all this kind of raging debate about him being you know demented and senile and all that nonsense that the Republicans push out there. Doesn't mean his age won't still be an issue. No, it's really interesting actually because I knew we were going to talk about this. I I looked up my my diaries this morning and. So this, I'd completely forgotten that it was it was literally in the wake of September the 11th. So on Monday, September the 17th, I recorded in my diary going up to the flat to see TB to tell him that the US was suggesting that he went to Congress with Bush. Oh, yeah, said TB, thinking I was joking. I said it was serious and I was worried about it because it would play into the whole poodle thing. And the poodle thing was going even within six days of 9-11. The poodle thing was going from day one as a sort of, you know, Tony Blair will just do what George Bush tells him to, etc. John Kerr, who you will know, now in the House of Lords, Permanent Secretary, Foreign Office, 
Cool to say it would be ghastly. The whole thing would become an orgy of US patriotism with TB in a kind of nod-along role. Now, now that's quite interesting because I did slightly worry about that with the Swedish prime minister when I was watching him. I did think this is fine, but the Swedish prime minister is being made to stand up and applaud every part of the domestic programme of Joe Biden. So, I, of course, he stood up very happily when Joe Biden, the reason he was there is he was Sweden being welcomed into NATO. So, of yeah. course, he stood up and he was thanked for Sweden joining NATO. But he then had to stand up and for clap everything. every infrastructure investment, what he's doing with yeah, the police, what he thinks about... Yeah. Well, if I, if I go to the, the, the now Thursday, the September the 20th, so we'd gone out to Washington, we'd had all hours with Bush and his team and talking about this, that and the other. And if you remember what happened, Bush couldn't travel. Bush wasn't allowed to travel in, in the immediate aftermath with all the security stuff. Tony was doing a lot of the, the traveling and we were going all over the place. Here we go. Up to the Bush flat before heading out to Congress. Bush and TB travel together in the presidential limo, which again is quite a big deal. Jonathan Powell, David Manning, Christopher Mayer, the ambassador and I, were taken up to the first lady's box with the press gallery to our right and the Congress down below. TB came in with Laura Bush. Here's one for you. Rudy G- Giuliani, uh, mayor of New York. George Pataki, governor of New York. And the guy who was going to be the new Homeland Security Minister. Now, this is me. Tom, Tom Ridge, right? Tom Ridge, yeah. Oh, but a real reminder, again, for listeners who have not followed the changes, it's Rudy Giuliani, who is now, you know, villain number one. Yeah. Conspiracy theorist oh, number one. was hero was a, number was one. Was extraordinary hero, wasn't he? Yeah. So they obviously decided that, they, were, they wanted Giuliani right up there with Laura Bush. Tony was sitting next to Laura Bush. I, I then say, I'm not really enjoying this very much at all. It was all a bit Politburo, standing ovations, constantly interrupting the speech, rapturous applause for good lines, off the radar if they were really good. Because TB was next to Laura, he had to get up. This is your Swedish prime minister point. He had to get up every single time that she did, which was every time everybody else did. Angie Hunter was watching me from the other side of the gallery and said later, I looked like I'd swallowed a lemon. It was grim, poodleology gone mad. But it was an excellent speech for all that, very well crafted. We met up with Bush afterwards and he gave TB an enormous bear hug. This was getting worse. He was very warm to me, but I couldn't wait to get out. It was just like, so we were, it's like a sort of massive staged event. Yeah. But I tell you what, I, I watched um, Biden's. I tell you what was really interesting was, so there you, you see the, the vice president and the speaker sitting directly behind the mm-hmm. president. You've got the, the governing, you've, you had Biden's people here yeah. and, the, and, and the Republicans there. Yeah. What I remember from the George Bush speech was that there was a lot more what I would call bipartisan standing ovation. Ah. They, when it came to stuff like national security, they were all getting up. Right. Whereas I noticed that Biden was getting heckled a bit and, and I thought he dealt with the hecklers pretty well. But I, I get the sense that the place is, is much less kind of collegiate maybe than well, it, it was. Well, it became, I mean, for a State of the Union address, I, I don't know the history of these things, but of course it's very political. I mean, the boundary between him as the present non-political, and you actually had Nancy Pelosi chanting four more years, yeah. four more years, yeah. four more years, which obviously no Republicans can no, stand, sure, up and, sure. stand up and endorse. So the more he attacked Trump. My predecessor. My predecessor. He didn't, he, name, he didn't him. name him. I thought that was quite cute. I also thought, I was seeing it in the context of having been yesterday to King's Cross to the Light Room, where mm-hmm. there's this amazing show on uh, the US space missions to the moon, narrated by Tom Hanks. And it's this enormous room with screens all around you. So you can see 40 images at a time. And I was watching it with my mother-in-law, who's an American. And I hope she doesn't mind me saying she was crying during it. She was so moved by Kennedy's speech, by the hope, the optimism, the ambition of that period. What did he announce it at State of Union speech? He No, he announced it in a speech, I think, somewhere in Texas. Mm. He makes a joke about, about a Texan football team at the time. But I think for her, there was the sense that this was America at its most optimistic. And this was, mm. you know, Kennedy essentially saying, we're going to travel to the moon because we can, but then connecting it to a mission of peace and hope mm. and America changing the world. And through her eyes, I got a sense of sort of deep, deep disappointment, the sense of an American dream, you know, becoming more difficult. Her feeling that she can no longer respond. I mean, obviously she's a very strong Biden supporter, but 
not being able to respond to America in the way that she felt that she was able to under Kennedy. And so I, what I suppose I'm saying is, please go and see the, um, the show because it's the most incredible mm. way of seeing the moon landings and the images from the moon, but also as a way of understanding the 20th century in the United States. I mean, the speaker, Johnson, he, I mean, Angie said that I looked like I'd swallowed a lemon. He looked like he swallowed a lemon. Uh, he wasn't, when, when he did applaud, it was very kind of peremptory. Um, I noticed he said afterwards that he felt that it was fine on the foreign policy stuff, but the rest of it was all too kind of political. But I think it's quite hard at the moment for, if you're Joe Biden, you have all this stuff being pumped out against you the whole time. Trump absolutely kind of, you know, on it the whole time. I thought he dealt with it pretty well. I mean, and I got a sense there of what his narrative going into the election is going to be. And what it was, was that? He, he, he's owning the age. He's owning the age and turning it into experience and values and believing in America and knowing America. Yeah, there was, there was just on that one nice line in it for people who haven't watched it. He's, he points out he was elected to Senate at 29 and he used to be refused access to the elevators because people thought he was too young. He was too it's young. Like, yeah. He said, I've been too young, I've been too yeah, old, but yeah. I know America. I thought he focused a lot on the future, um, big challenges, and I and I thought he I thought you he, you could it was clear where he's going to come at Trump. It's about the it's about the dishonesty, it's about the chaos, it's about the lack of values. I saw some of the Republicans getting very agitated when he was reminding them. You know that line, one of the best lines in the speech. I thought you know Reagan said to Gorbachev, "Tear down that wall." Yeah. And Trump says to Putin, do whatever the hell you like. And they got very angry at that, didn't they? Yeah. And they had to repeat, I'm quoting, he said that. Yeah, I'm exactly. Quoting, he a said Republican that. Yeah. president yeah. said that and it's yeah. wrong and it's unacceptable, etc. And of course, he also challenged him about the attack on the Capitol. I mean, he, that, that was oh, also yeah. very embarrassing to them because yeah. he said, you guys all sat there, yeah. you know what happened. And, and, and of course, a lot of those people sitting there have since sort of taken Trump's side on that. Well, we had the... Um, if people don't follow this, there's, there's something called the Lincoln Project, which uh, is clearly is, is is less of a pro Biden thing than a very anti Trump thing. But they put out a thing this week, which was uh, it's uh, it's a spoof of Trump, uh, and Trump is making a speech, basically saying what he really thinks of all these Republican uh, senators and congressmen right. and women who who support him when he knows they hate him. Right. And it's very, very well done because it's just a section, a selection while he's speaking of pictures of these people, most of whom not known to, to, to Wait us. A sec, is this a deep fake AI it's, attack ad? Well, the only thing is I'd say, I'd say it's satire. <laughs> it is a bit deep fake, yeah. But put it this, it's obvious. It's, the thing is, the reason why I think it's not deep fake is obvious it's fake. That's right, okay. Um, I hope it's obvious. It's it is obvious. Yeah, you it, should watch yeah. it. We should put it in the show, in the, in the yeah. newsletter, and it's obvious. But the thing is that, and I'll tell you the other thing that happened on the back of it, they had a massive fundraising drive for the Democrats, yep. which was very, very successful into the sort of tens of millions. He did a very good, the next day, he, did a, he was out and about, Biden. He also did a very good kind of short uh, video um, projecting himself based on the themes of the speech, but then sort of, and he then was calling Trump Trump. He didn't call him Trump in the, in the in the speech, but he was then saying, you know, so I led us through COVID. He kind of lied his way through COVID. Um, you know, he was just kind of doing these very very strong attack lines and 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 using quite a lot of humour as well, and, and taking the Mickey out of Trump, which I think is quite an effective way of getting to him. One of the um, one of the reasons maybe for the strategy that you've laid out is that the opinion polls show that the election seems to be about what people think about Trump, not what people think about Biden. That's very, very unusual with an incumbent president. Mm. So incumbent president like Obama, when he ran, 67% of people said what they were voting on was Obama's record in office. When George W. Bush ran, overwhelming, like 67%, it's George W. Bush, not Gore, that they're voting on when Gore was running against George W. Bush. This time... 62% say they're voting because they're pro-Trump on one side, and 64% say they're voting because they're against Trump. And only a third mention Biden on either side. Mm. So it's very unusual. I mean, it, it's a Trump election, not a Biden election. Biden's personality hasn't yet come through enough in a way that's really surprising. Yeah, but back to the point that Biden owning his age, I mean, Biden is a very, very, very well-known political figure. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, he's been a, he was the youngest ever senator. Trump's a very well-known figure and was president, but Trump is kind of known as Trump. And people have the views about him are less about him as a politician. It's about him as a human being. Whereas I think with, I think the other thing that came through with Biden was the guy does have, um, even when he bumped into that awful, what's her name? Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, when she was there yep. with her MAGA hat yep. on and he sort of did this very funny kind of eye popping look. He's got a lovely way with people. So the, and the, so the next day, Trump did a speech where he was taking the mickey out of Joe Biden's stutter. He's got a slight, he's still got a slight yep. stutter. You see it occasionally. And so Trump was doing this, you know, Joe, b -b 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 -b. and of course it reminded people of the time when Trump took the mickey out of a disabled journalist. And like within minutes, the Democrats had got out this, this kind of, um, this film where on the top half was Trump doing his taking the mickey. Yep. And on the bottom half was a, an encounter that Biden had a few years ago with a kid who stammered yeah. and telling him, you know, and just show. So I think they are going to put, try to get Biden's personality on the ballot. But, but it's about Trump. I agree with you. But there are problems. If you look at what's happened, uh, Biden has gone quite quickly from disapproving 50% of the population, approving 43%. Mm -hmm to disapproving 56%, approving 38%. So he's gone from a 7.1% net disapproval to an 18.2% mm. net disapproval. And as I think we've discussed on the podcast before, it's particularly dramatic among Hispanic voters and black voters. Traditionally, those were voters who absolutely were guaranteed to vote overwhelmingly for the Democratic Party. They were a very important part of Biden's last victory. But Hispanic voters have gone from 24% polling as voting Republican to 40%. And black voters from 4% up to 20% now considering voting for Trump. And so I think that's partly about, if, if you've defined Biden's mission, let me try to define Trump. I think Trump is appealing to people who think it's about economics and the cost of living, who aren't very liberal, not very interested in liberal chat, who are dissatisfied with politics and who want fundamental change mm. and who like him on crime and immigration. Interestingly, the um, Democrats tried to say, when Trump started talking about crime and immigration, they said, oh, this is a big mistake. It's a dog whistle to his right wing base. Actually, a lot of African-American Hispanic voters have responded well mm. to Trump talking also, about crime. Uh, it, within the speech, Biden was doing the tough on crime stuff. Um, and, and needing to. Yeah, yeah. Because they've clearly signaled that that's, that's been a, a, a weakness. I mean, another thing on the polling. So when they fought it out last time, Biden had a 50-point lead amongst non-white Americans. And it's now down to a 12-point lead, 56 to 44. Now, you can get some of that back, but that does show a shift. And... I mean, look, you and I find it hard to imagine how anybody can vote Trump. I think most people outside America do. When I was in Australia, I, couldn't, I didn't meet a single person who thought it was anything other than hideous that thought he might come back. Um, but there's something going on in the American debate. And also the other thing I saw, I mean, it was absolutely horrific. There was a Republican Party event, I think it was in Kansas, where they had this life-size dummy effigy of Joe Biden where people were just queuing to punch it, kick it, hit it with hammers. I mean, it's just nuts stuff that's going on there. And I think he was, remember Michelle Obama's famous line, you know, when they go low, we stay high. There was an element of that in Biden's speech, but it was also pretty tough. Yeah. He was, he, he, he was showing, and this is what I liked about, I, mean, I said this before about Biden in the first campaign when he beat Trump. He does have this ability, which I don't think, I think most people don't have, which is that not to let Trump get too close inside his head. That was not a guy who was scared of Trump. No. That was a guy who was knocking him all over the place. And there's something very sincere. I, I was, you can pick up on C-SPAN a little bit of those chats that he's having after his speech. You know, oh, he's good the, at that. The Romanian ambassador and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But there was a little moment where he just said to someone, you know, it's just, this guy's terrible. Mm. It'd just be terrible for our mm. democracy if we took over. And there's a sense of kind of earnestness and sincerity there, which... Mm. But still, still, unfortunately, the March 7th polls, he's lagging by five percentage points. Yeah, yeah. Um, amongst registered voters. 
Biden is lagging Trump by five percentage points. And we don't really know why. We don't know why particularly non-white voters seem to be sort of, you know, no longer pro-Biden. Is it the economy? Is it the Democrats have gone too far left? Is Mm. it Democrats gone Mm. too far right? I mean, again, as you can imagine, Democrats can't quite decide amongst themselves. uh, um, We should just very briefly close off this part of the discussion with, with, with what he said about Israel and Gaza and this... This um, this poor and allied to the fact that since the State of the Union, he's had some pretty critical comments about Netanyahu. And Netanyahu has has hit back. I wonder if he is slightly recalibrating the way that he handles Netanyahu. He is very pro-Israel. He's been very very supportive in so many levels. But I wonder if the patience is getting a little bit well, thin. I was talking to someone right in his you know who was right in his inner circle, and. He said that the problem initially with Biden, and this is a bit, it's a bit, um, you know, maybe a bit blunt, but that Biden has just felt in his whole political career very, very, very close to Israel. Yeah. And this individual said that he never felt that Biden had much interest actually in, in Arabs or the Middle East. He didn't have an emotional resonance. He said he's actually a very empathetic man, has emotional resonance for many people on an individual level, but this just wasn't an issue that ever really moved him. Which sort of surprises me because he, he's sort of, maybe it's because I've seen him in the in the Northern Ireland context, but you always get the, I always get the feeling of him as being kind of on the side of the underdog. Now you can argue that Israel's an underdog in one, on one level, but in this context, it's quite hard to argue that when you see what's happening in Gaza. Yeah. Um, and he's also an incredibly empathetic. He's genuinely empathetic. Yeah. Um, and yet he has been, I think, pretty slow to get to the point that it, and what they're doing now with this port, it may or may not work. Um, but, uh, but also this is the first time that I think he's really called Netanyahu. He actually said that, you know, he's, he's doing Israel more harm than good. Uh, it, or, and, yeah. and, and said that Rafa will be a red line as well. Yeah. But then of course, unfortunately then in the same interview managed to contradict himself and say there, there are no red lines and there's no conditions for support. Yeah. He was definitely yeah. upping the rhetoric. No doubt about that. Good. Okay. Well, moving on briefly uh, to the budget. So <laughs> the budget was really talked, this is the, the UK budget, was really talked up in the British press, spring budget, and it was seen as the great opportunity to redefine the narrative for the general election. Now, do you think the British journalists believed that or they were just looking for something to fill the papers in the two weeks leading up to the budget? There was so much of this sort of stuff from the kind of inner circle of you know, what's Rishi Sunak going to do? What's what's Jeremy Hunt going to do? What are they going to do with tax? How are they going to win the election? What's the rabbit they're putting out of the hat? And then the thing happened. And I felt watching it that it was should have been obvious from day one that there was nothing they could do, that there was no way this budget was going to turn it around. They simply don't have the headroom or the movement. There's nothing, literally <laughs> nothing they could have done that would have turned it around. So do you think the journalists would just just feel they have to talk it up? That they sort of pretend it's the Super Bowl. No, I don't. I don't feel that. I think. I think there was a. I, look, it's true that journalists do make things up, but I think something like a budget, it's not that difficult for a government to shape a narrative. So I think they were shaping this narrative. Um, and, and, what, and, what was the narrative exactly? Well, I think the, <laughs> no, the, the, the narrative w- was basically about you know tax cutting. Okay. Right. Um, and it was about laying traps for la- traps for labor. Right. That was the narrative they were that they were putting out there. And I, and I think my sense is that because the rules have completely broken down, broken down, is that all the stuff that was in there they kept sort of feeding it out, and it it wasn't really moving the dial for them. So they kept feeding more stuff out. And by the time the day came, there was kind of nothing. And I've got to be honest. I was in Australia. It was very hard to find the television station that was covering it. Eventually, I was sort of watching the, par- the Parliament Channel, um, and I—you've th- got to say—the Tory MPs did not look like they were enjoying themselves. So, if, for, for people who didn't follow the budget, the big announcement was that he's cut uh, national insurance, the bit that the Again. employee pays, by two percent, um, and he has also put a pretty tough austerity definition on spending says that spending will only increase by 1% in real terms. Mm. And that's, that, that is a problem. I mean, that, that, that's a, a challenge for labor because of course, big commitments have already been made to the NHS. And, the and he stole some of the clothes with the, made changes to the non-DOM 
yeah. So, exactly. so he could have lent into that more. I mean, I think, um, you know, my great friend here, David Gork, said, you know, he thought that actually that was a little bit aggressive and wasn't what he would have wanted to do. But equally, Jeremy Hunt could have behaved worse. You know, he mm. could have made more of it. He could have said, well, then he's going to let it go up by 0.75%, for example. But the fundamental framing problem is that nobody believes, nobody cares. I mean, my sense is that you could announce a 10% cut in taxes now, and everybody would be like, well, it's just going to be turned around after the next election anyway. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, the markets wouldn't allow him to do anything very yeah. dramatic, because if he did, it would be like Liz Truss, right? If there was mm. huge, unfunded mm. tax yeah, cuts. I, I think the other share. impact of Liz Truss is that the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, which was Osborne's creation, um, it's almost like you can't challenge it now because she completely cut them out and that has elevated their status. Yeah. And so he, I think that ties them in more. They, they basically say that the economy is going to grow a bit faster. Uh, and, but they also say that and government, the cost of borrowing is going to fall, but the underlying debt is incredibly high and tax levels are incredibly high. And remember I said last week that the people I always listen to on the budget are Paul Johnson of the Institute yeah. of Fiscal Studies and Torsten Bell yeah. at the Resolution Foundation. So just go through what Paul Johnson's kind of top line summary was. Um, not a game changer. Still heading for a parliament which people will on average be worse off at the end of the start. That's pretty grim for the Tories. A debt to G GDP ratio that is its highest level in 70 years. Debt interest payments close to all time high. Worrying increase in the number of individuals moving on to health and disability related benefits. Um, and so, you know, I think for as a, as a kind of big economic big picture, very, very bleak for them and, and not that much that moved the dial for them. Unfortunately, that is also quite bleak for an incoming government. Oh, yeah. right? It's not like you coming in in 97 when no. the macroeconomic conditions were reasonably positive. This is coming into a situation as he's just described. And yeah. that's a real problem. Well, he says, he says this, the combination of high debt interest payments and low forecast nominal growth means the next parliament could prove to be the most difficult of any in 80 years for a chancellor wanting to bring debt down. Uh, also, you won't like this one, investment spending, uh, massively reduced. And it is going to be incredibly hard to to rebuild public services in, on, on the back of an economic picture like this. Um, and so <laughs> I like this slide as well. He said, the pledge to cut taxes by more than 40 billion goes in the same bucket as the pledges to increase defence spending. Not worth the paper it's written on unless accompanied by some sense of how it would be afforded. And Torsten Bell, in his analysis, he, said, he talked about a fiscal fiction and actually said there are going to be, have to be massive public sector cuts, public service cuts, um, to meet the numbers that, that, that he set out there. The, the only um, small thing that Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert, applauded is he'd been campaigning hard for a change to the way that child benefit was paid. Yeah. And so yeah. there's, been a, a, there's been slight unfairness, which if we ever wanted to get, you know, well, we should get Paul Johnson on, actually. I'd love to interview him. Yeah. But but one of the technical problems, I think, which, again, David Gork was explaining to me that they Trouble talk... is we don't like interviewing people who know more about things than we do. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's one of our rules. <laughs> that's right. We're OK on that. <laughs> we can listen to him a bit. Um, no, is that is the, the we find it very difficult in Britain, particularly, to count household income. Mm. So um, if you have two people earning £49,000 a year, so you get £98,000 household income, they get treated better than a single person earning 50,000. And we don't really know mm. what to do with that. Yeah. Torsten Bell talked about um, a sour taste for whoever wins the next election. 19 billion of post-election tax rises, another 19 billion of public service cuts built into what he's, that's even what's admitted. Um, and I, I, the other thing is, I mean, Paul Johnson talked about a conspiracy of silence between government and, and opposition, not, not acknowledging the scale of the challenges. And I do think it's really, really strange that they they cannot even bring themselves to say that Brexit is a big part of this mess. Soon that was out the next day talking about, you know, oh, we've had the war, in, we've had the pandemic and we've had the war in Ukraine and these have been yeah. big shocks. Brexit has been a massive, massive well, hit on uh, the economy. Yeah, again, I mean, rejoin the customs union. Dear Keir Starmer, if you're listening, rejoin the customs union. Number one most obvious way of restoring confidence and getting our economy off the ground. Yeah. 
Okay, well, on Labour not joining the customs union, let's take a break. Welcome back to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And we are unfortunately recording in uh, Methodist Central Hall uh, on a day where Lee Anderson, who we normally try not to mention in the podcast and who, for international listeners, is this... Unmentionable. Figure, well, he's this figure, I mean, who was a Labour councillor who I think I'm right in saying was expelled from the Labour Party. I think he was militant at one point as well. Militant right, okay, tendency. so he can come from the far left Labour mm. Party, mm. then... You know, and then he managed to become a Conservative MP under Boris Johnson. Promoted by Rishi Sunak to Deputy Re- Chairman. Re- Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. Yeah. So he was there to be you know, mobilising votes for the Conservative Party. Then managed to say that, that uh, Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, was controlled by Islamists, for which he was fired from the Conservative Party, and has now just shown his extraordinary loyalty to this party, of which he was Deputy Chairman but a few weeks ago, by announcing today that he's joined Reform, the post-Brexit party vehicle for Nigel Farage's ego. And uh, and how, how long before presumably Farage throws him out too? So he... Well, he could get, I mean, I think it would be a record. Uh, I saw that, um, uh, was it Tim Farron, the Liberal Democrat, who was saying, oh God, what if he comes to us next? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and he, he look, this, this, this just, I, th- I think for most, mem- there will be, be some people who look at Lee Anderson and think, yeah, you know, working class bloke, speaks his mind and all that. But I think to most people, he is, in, he, that, the woman, do you remember the woman from the Reform Party that I had a bit of an exchange yes, with on, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. on Newsnight? Yeah, yeah. She's on record as saying that Lee Anderson is thick as mints. Um, so I don't think he's the brightest in the box. Uh, I only saw a little bit of his press conference where Beth Rigby from Sky News was basically saying, you know, isn't this, how are people supposed to think, you know, a few weeks ago you're saying the Tories are wonderful and now you've... More parties than Berlusconi. (laughs) Exactly, or Boris Johnson during COVID. And he he, he basically, and and Richard Tice was trying to be sort of nice and, you know, Richard Tice-ish and sort of, you know, I'm the modern man. And, and, And Lee Anderson listened to Beth Rigby and then just said, he said, country first, party second, country first, constituency second, party third, next question. And then as Rich Tyres tried to sort of, you know, be a bit more emollient with Beth Rigby, just so, so there's a next question, next question. And he's just not, he's, he's, he's like, he's, ah, anyway, we shouldn't really be talking about him. He's a complete ridiculous person. But, on, but this now means, by the way, that the leader of reform, Tice, the president of reform, Farage, and their star, star MP, Anderson, all have shows on GB News. That's right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's well, and GB News, which now um, appears to be in serious financial trouble. There was an interesting yeah. uh, tweet by Andrew Neil, who should know, because I think he was employed by GB News, wasn't he? Saying that Talk TV had eventually had to fold because even Murdoch couldn't afford to underwrite it. And that GB News has been losing many, many millions every year, and even very rich people ultimately reach the end of their time. Yeah, but won't they just enjoy the sort of having, being part of the platform? Here we are talking about them again. I saw that Paul Marshall, the, uh, the ex, another one who's gone from sort of left to right, yeah. um, he was the main profile in, was it the Financial Times at the weekend? Oh, he would have loved that. Right. You know, with talk about me in the FT now, Rory. Marvellous. So no, I think, uh, I think they'll keep, 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 they'll keep, keep pouring keep, their keep millions keep pouring down the drain for a while longer. Now, this brings us to somebody that you very much want to discuss, and I'd, I'd really love to, to get you on because it's just fascinating. So it is a British... So when you, when you say this brings us to you, so Lee Anderson reminds you of skate life uh, because he's what, a triple, double, quadruple yeah, agent. Yeah, exactly. So as you said, uh, so Lee Anderson <laughs> to steak knife. So steak knife... Um, This is a man called Scapatici, born in 1946. He was a bricklayer who came from an Italian-Irish family. He's Catholic. He joined the Republican movement, was interned in Longkesh, uh, which happened to many, many people on the Sinn Féin IRA side. And then when he left, joined the absolute core of the IRA, which was called the Internal Security Unit. This is like the, just like the KGB was the great kind of elite of the Russian Communist Party, the Internal Security Unit was the absolute elite 
of the IRA. And and the, and the colloquial term, the nutting squad. Correct, because they would shoot people in the head. So, and from this position, he had access to all the information imaginable. It was the only group in the IRA that was allowed to interrogate anybody, get any assets it wanted. It knew the names of every single basically active member. It was allowed information on any informer. And because he was heading counterintelligence, it was just like Kim Philby, Mm. who spying for Russia managed to get himself appointed as the head of the anti-Soviet section Mm. in MI6, right? So Scapatici was there to investigate informers in the IRA, but he himself was an informant. So he'd been recruited by British military intelligence. And I think volunteered to them as, you know, presumably purely financial. I don't know whether there was an ideological thing, but he was pretty well paid. So he he, he was what was called a walk-in. He just walked in and, you know, volunteered himself. Now, of course, the intelligence agents would be very, very suspicious of that on one level. Um, But what then happened is that he became... I mean, the guy, this guy, Wisley, who was the general office commanding, much to the um, disgust and disgruntlement of of John Boucher, who who presented this report last week, um, saw him as, they they called him, you know, the, the, the goose that laid the golden egg. And the line that was run the whole time when people started to ask questions about this guy and about the, the various operations that were going on, well, okay, yeah, yeah, we, we, we knew that he was getting up to bad stuff, but he saved way more lives yeah. than were lost. So, so, so exactly. So ju- just as we come to the Boucher report, the problem was that he was now the deputy head of the IRA's equivalent to the KGB. He was involved in operations killing informers. So this is a British agent now going around murdering people on, on the streets of Belfast. And by the way, informants based on, you say that as though it's all proven that they're informants, based on their interrogations, their tortures, their, you know, some of, some of them will probably just have been caught up in bad stuff. Many of them innocent. And, and, and this is the point that Boucher makes, that the internal security unit itself was corrupted. So it was, there's no evidence that it, although it claimed that it was just killing informants, it was also killing people because they were having extramarital affairs with them and they wanted to knock off the husband. They were killing people because a business deal had gone wrong. And then the allegation against Scapatici is that maybe he was killing people in order to cover up for himself. So one of the the big cases was a guy called Joseph Fenton, who was another one of the incredible recruitments. So this was all part of the sort of 1980s recruitments by the intelligence services. Fenton was a man who ran safe houses for the IRA. And the Royal Arthur Constabulary managed to persuade him to bug all those houses. So he was able to produce 20 IRA members for arrest. He was able, through this information, to stop bomb teams on their way to set off bombs, were intercepted. He returned back to Britain and then returned back again to Ireland against the advice of many people and was then killed, almost certainly again, by if not by Scapatici himself, by Scapatici's unit. So this is now the most politicized thing possible because if you if you set aside intelligence, terrorism, Northern Ireland, and think about it in the UK context, it would be like running an agent in a top mafia gang and that agent themselves being an assassin who's going around murdering citizens and you're protecting their identity because you want the intelligence on the mafia gang. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, so just talk about John Boucher for a minute because this, this is a guy was in Bedfordshire Police um, goes and investigates this whole thing. Meantime, is currently the chief constable of the police service in Northern Ireland. Um, so I think that's what gave the his presentation of the report and maybe an additional power because he certainly wasn't holding his punches. And this is a guy, presumably, who's having to deal with the security services on a day-to-day basis now. Um, but he was essentially was saying that um, they... He found, the, he found the MI5 very, very difficult to deal with, that they were with, withholding information that he felt should have been there. And there was, a, there was a coroner's case last week where the coroner, in the end, decided, this, just this week, decided to drop the whole thing because so much of the material that he needed to be able to form a judgment on this thing had just been redacted. 
um, uh, and again, a, a, a former we, we've terrorist en- We've case. encountered this a bit, haven't we, about um, Shamima Begum and all these claims, which were part of our Sajid Javid interview about you know, how you can act on secret and top secret information. With the, and it, it goes to the heart of the fundamental fight always between the police and intelligence services. So the police want to catch people, prosecute them, put them in prison. The intelligence services want to keep running their agents for as long as possible to find out as much information as possible. And I think the police do have an understanding of that. They do, but they're under much, much stricter rules. The rules for the police were very clear from the 1960s onwards, but f- and it, they've changed. I mean, if you were to work for MI5 or MI6 today, there are far more lawyers than there were in the past. There are much, much clearer guidance. But in the era when Steak Knife was being run in the 80s, um, it, you know, there's a book by Mark Urban, which I think is called Big Boys Rules. It was a very, very macho culture. And of course, what John Butcher's report, which is, I mean, it's an interesting report. I, I struggle my way through it. My goodness, mm. it's pretty heavy going. Oh, and yeah. The first half of it is just endlessly coming back to me, I, me, John's, you know, first person singer again and again, talking about his methodology, who he talked to, how he recruited, the continuous professional development of his staff. I mean, it's a pretty bureaucratic document. I wish some of that stuff had been kind of shoved to the mm. end. Because this is, he, by the way, this is just the interim report. Right. This one doesn't, this, this one doesn't even name... Uh, Scapatici. Um, so, but I, t- I, t- I think what I think is interesting in this, though, is that you, you mentioned the relationship between police and intelligence. Um, but I'll tell you the other thing, which I mean, and I, I noticed this, I guess, particularly in relation to Iraq and the build up to the Iraq war, is that the whole kind of the mood around intelligence people is such that, and, and within this, Boucher talks in his report about the dangers of the neither confirm nor deny in relation to agents, that you can you can use that secrecy. I can remember, you know, Richard Dearlove, for example, head of, of, of SIS, MI6, and, you know, coming in and, and, and you, you just take at face value, you know, we have this agent uh, and this agent is saying such and such. And... He did have, they did have an agent, and he wasn't saying, you know, the, the, the goose that lays the golden egg. But these guys were saying the goose that lays the golden egg. They were saying that this, this guy is just such a good source for us, so, so useful to us. And I think sometimes, I don't know whether it's changed, but I, think, I wonder if sometimes politicians as well don't, don't challenge enough the intelligence no, no, that you, they've been You're given. completely right, and I think this is true, I'm afraid, even if the Intelligence Security Committee, that... Politicians don't necessarily have a background in this. There's a James Bond atmosphere. It's very easy for the spies to come in and sound glamorous and secretive and be charming and quite difficult to get the accountability. I mean, Boucher's point here is that he thinks that steak knife was probably responsible for more deaths than he said. Yeah, well, he says that he said the, um, the, he talks about fairy tales, that the idea that he was saving hundreds of lives is absolute fa- fables and fairy tales. Maximum saved, high single figures, low double figures. Yeah. Now, I vouch this much more deeply in this than I am, but to, to make the case for the intelligence officers a little bit yeah. pushing back. Yeah. And also, to, to, and, and, and I think to remind people that to, to, be, <laughs> to be a British intelligence agent in Northern Ireland during that time took a lot of guts. Took a lot of guts. And actually, to be Scapatici took a lot of guts. I mean, that was an unbelievably dangerous thing he was mm. doing. And he will have had access to an incredible amount of information because of the nature of that unit. It was able to go anywhere, ask any question it liked in the IRA. Properly run, he would have been an absolute goldmine. Now, whether you can list it as the number of lives saved, because one of the problems is that often you couldn't act on his information because if you acted on his information, you'd be betraying him, which is one of the real problems for, for policing this. But I would guess that he would have given them an almost complete picture of most of the senior levels, the IRA from that position. And that, that would, would have been very, very valuable. I mean, there are, there are pictures of him with um, at funerals and at other events. And he's there, there's Adams, there's McGuinness. He's, you know, he was a somebody within the whole movement. Yeah, he was de- de- deputy, deputy head of the elite yeah, unit yeah. of the IRA. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, to, to be the intelligence guy who's in charge of that, 
and running that. And of course, and you know there's an English football element to this, Rory? No. Well, he was a Manchester City fan. Scapatici. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of the debriefing was he, he had this reason to go to England. Oh, to, to go and watch football matches. To go matches. and watch Manchester City. And then, and then you could sit next to him in the stands and then, debrief well, him in the stands. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. They could meet up yeah. with him and, yeah. and, and, uh, and debrief him. But also, where do you, how do you think this leaves us in relation to... So the Tories have had this thing about the protection of soldiers uh, and the Northern Ireland Legacy Act, which Johnny Mercer has been you know, very, very keen on, on getting through, which essentially halts press investigations into potential crimes that were committed back then. But there will be people thinking that these crimes should be investigated as well. Um, now, I suspect some of the people who support that will actually be saying, well, aren't there issues here with these people that should be looked at? And John Boucher is certainly saying that yeah. somebody like Scott yeah. yeah. should have been, yeah. Yeah. Should have been uh, gone through the courts. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's incredibly difficult because the only way that you can recruit somebody like that who's the it's an imminent danger of their lives i mean the, the point is he would have been nutted by the nutting squad immediately if they'd found out and martin mcginnis has given open interviews saying it was absolutely red that if you informed you would be killed and martin McGuinness, you know completely unapologetic about that you can only persuade him to work for you if he absolutely trusts that you will protect his identity that you will not be prosecuting him for what he does and what John Boucher is now doing is a fundamental threat to the ability to recruit agents. If an agent says, well, wait a second, how do I know in 15 years' time a police officer is not going to come along and demand on behalf of families accountability, transparency, and all this kind of stuff? The state knife did come to England, lived in England, was protected, and died, we assume, of natural causes in his 70s. Yeah, with the British government still, and I think correctly, refusing to acknowledge or deny, no, confirm that, or deny. Yeah, that he was state knife because that's that's the deal. I mean, he would expect them not to do that. Yeah. Shows you as well, though, the hum, hum, humint, as we call it, still very, very important. Incredibly important. Right. Well, finally, I think just, just for a couple of minutes, Portuguese elections, which we talked about last week, Portugal was always the slight outlier, I guess, in Europe. Um, one of the great hopes is the social democratic movements in Europe have faded. I mean, your early days, I was thinking about this, you know, there was this great moment for social democrats, along with Blair and Clinton, there was Costa Semitis in Greece, there was Zapatero in Spain, there was Socrates in Portugal. And, and then, then, then Guterres. And then Guterres. And then from 2008 onwards, a bit of a decline, actually quite a dramatic decline across Europe, leaving us only with Denmark, Germany, Spain, Romania, and Portugal as being proper social democratic parties in power. Hopefully the United Kingdom before too long. Hopefully the United Kingdom before too long. I'm, I'm definitely the United Kingdom before too long. Um, but now the Portuguese election in which it looks as though the balance of power is going to sit with this far-right party, Chega, and their leader, André Ventura. Mm. So the Socialist Party, Antonio Costa, the Socialist Party, was in power, resigned over this scandal, um, and the, the sort of conservative alliance, uh, well, they're, they're called the D Democratic Alliance, but they're, they're basically the conservatives look like they've got the biggest share of the vote. Socialist second, Chega, this far right party third. Now, it could have been, this could be out of date by the time this goes out, because we're recording this on late on Monday. Um, the initial noises from uh, Montenegro, Luis Montenegro, who's the leader of the, the, the sort of their conservatives, is that he won't do a deal with Chega, um, which leaves open very interesting possibilities of... Although, I, although of course, there is this form on that, isn't it? I mean, yeah. often European politicians say they won't do a deal with the far right, but then in Sweden, eventually they did. Yeah, but it's interesting in Holland, in the Netherlands, they still they're haven't still holding stitched, up, still still haven't stitched to it together. Still refusing to let in, yeah. Um, so we'll see. And this guy, Ventura, kind of classic uh, <laughs> trainee priest, football pundit, uh, very much playing the traditional sort of crime, immigration, all that stuff. Um, and he has gone from sort of virtually a standing start to, you know, not far off 20%. I think it's about 18% that he got. Um, so, yeah, and it will, it will, I presume, will reshape the Portuguese part of the European elections as well. Um, but it just shows you poor old, poor old Costa chugging along very nicely. People think he's doing a pretty good job. And then somebody balls up, scandal, bye.
Yeah, yeah. Well, there we are. Well, there we are. thank you, Alistair, very much. Pleasure. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye.